the uh, uh, speakers, Alejandro Acosta is a uh, um, black nigger and Wesley Correa, CEO and uh, founder of uh, uh, and Jose Cutua, the director general of Simeon Company Chile, who's uh, going to be with us uh, uh, from uh, uh, Chile. So I welcome uh, the three of them and uh, I give the floor to Alejandro, who will start. Alejandro. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sandra, for uh, introducing me. It's a bit late, but we'll do our best for the tutorial to uh, uh, come out as well as we can. Could we share the screen, please? That's not, that doesn't match my screen. So let's briefly talk about, uh, can we share what I have in Zoom? No? So let me tell you about today's tutorial. We are going to focus on IPv6. It's the tutorial that we have uh, addressed uh, several events. However, we always like to add uh, some uh, tweaks here and there based on uh, the feedback we uh, receive after each course. So we're going to divide it this way. At the beginning, we're going to talk about a very interesting feature to route uh, IPv4 and uh, uh, traffic uh, where it's an IPv6 only network. You've heard a lot, we can do that with TLS, but we're going to do it native. That is something that is increasingly popular. And there's a paper, it's an RTF that was published many years ago, but slowly the vendors have in, been uh, embedding it uh, in uh, their um, SOs, uh, in, in their OS. Uh, we are going to talk about, well, the, the, the data centers, oh, it's, uh, typically grow from uh, the uh, beginning, uh, will grow on IPv6, and that is uh, very beneficial. There are many companies in the country, in the world, that are doing it uh, quite a lot. They are IPv6 only. However, there's a, always that connectivity with the people that uh, the, the, the people with IPv4 can browse uh, the websites uh, that are hosted in the data centers. And finally, today, we are going to have an issue that is very interesting that is being added for the first time in this tutorial that basically refers to IPv6 provisioning in 10 GPON networks. I'm very happy that we'll break in that topic. And that is going to be um, addressed by Jose Coutua. For IPv6, we are going to have Wesley Correa oh, somewhere around here. And the rest of the morning, uh, I'm going to be in charge.
Vale. Muchísimas gracias al apoyo técnico recibido. Thank you for the technical support. So we are going to talk a bit about IPv4 traffic uh, routing in IPv6 only networks. For many years, and this is an issue that that is not a good thing, you can publish IPv6 prefixes in a BGP session established in IPv4. So I can have a, uh, and I enter a session, a BGP session that is already established in IPv4 uh, with the IPv6 prefixes. And I can, and I can also announce an IPv4 uh, prefix on top. This is absolutely valid. BGP supports it, most people support it, but in the end, it's quite horrible. It's horrible. So please don't do it that way. That's what I, that's my message. It's because if tomorrow you, you want to do troubleshooting, if you want to fix anything, maybe if I'm told that a prefix uh, that has no causality or whatever, you have to do troubleshooting, you have to support that BGP session, we're going to do very poorly. So to do that, we have uh, this in the Cisco routers. This is more or less how it works. I establish the BGP session. Let's say that we're going to do it in IPv4, but I, I want it to be uh, they announce IPv6 uh, prefix. I can receive IPv6 prefix. I'm going to uh, uh, make it through the roamer and uh, then. Um, this is supported, and I can see it in IPv4, and this can be done through the NLRI um, uh, uh, protocols that enable you to modify the values and do that. Once in the D6 operation in IETF, uh, in a session, they conducted a small survey to see how operators were doing that, uh, the BGP sessions that uh, they had, if they were going to announce IPv4 prefixes, if they do it on IPv6, and if, and, and uh, what would happen with the IPv6 prefixes in IPv6 uh, sessions. And fortunately, 99% had done it well in my life. I only one organization that that the quote unquote a crazy thing of announcing prefixes on a protocol that is not the appropriate one for the announcements. So before going any further, let me uh, tell you about this book, BGP in the Data Center, because many of the concepts that we are going to touch upon today were described in this book, and it is very good. It's quite a short uh, book that uh, you can read uh, very comfortably by O'Reilly. To understand the rest of my talk, let me give you a brief description of some things that are important in the BGP world. You know that there are four BGP messages open, update, keep alive, and notification. Open is to open the connection. Remember that TCP runs uh, so that BGP runs on TCP uh, in the 179. Then we have a message that is update that not only announces the prefixes but confirms uh, the new path, uh, the next drop. So if I'm announcing a prefix, let I'm so that that can be done with the update BGP message. There is a message that is also exists in many other protocols. That is the keep alive message. Uh, if I have a session established with one of you, I'm always going to constantly send you a, a brief message saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, so that the BGP session won't uh, be closed. It will remain active. And there is a message that's called notification that usually is a negative um, message. It very often reports errors or and and may reset the BGP session, which is a very negative thing. Other concept that we have here before going any further is um, the AFI, the AFI. Usually, when, when you when you can you, you announce a protocol. We speak of AFI is the address family information. 
And there's another message, another family that is called Safi. That is subsequent address family information. So AFI is IPv6 here, and it is taking unicast. Basically, this is a way, as BGP will tell you, I'm communicating Here I'm showing the slides. Um, um, this is the next. In the BGP world, there are some values that are important address, a family ident uh, identifiers or information, and subsequent address family information. So using those variables, I can tell a friend, you, I'm going to announce a prefix, an IPv4 unicast or multicast prefix, or in the MPLS world, that you have many huge uh, AFIs and SAFIs. It's thanks to this flexibility offered by the multi-protocol BGP. So how does this work? of routing of traffic, of IPv4 traffic in IPv6-only networks in a nutshell. Everything is defined in the RFCs. You can read this, 5549, but I'd like to summarize it in three steps. The first thing, the peers send routement advertisement. Remember that the RAs is a pack a packet that that routers send frequently. The second, you negotiate capacities. And in the third, at the end, you establish the BGP session. The RAs, the router advertisements, only for us to have it in the radar. These are packets. Obviously, if we are speaking of NDP, that is going to send this router to the network constantly. As a matter of fact, in the geek world, in the nerd world, there's a joke that says that a router is so uh, proud of being a router that keeps telling everybody, I exist, I exist, I exist. So that is, in a nutshell, what do they will do with this uh, uh, packet. So this uh, as we are auto configuring our devices in this network, we have the routers that are sending RAs and including the prefix and some other information. The cell phone of your friend receives it and auto configures it. But so it's sending RAs. So you know who the router is in the network. Then we have capacity negotiation. So let's rescue the concept of capacities. This is what the router announces uh, of the characteristics that that they can admit. I, I compare this with uh, languages. If the, our friend speaks five languages, but uh, he speaks only three, they're going to, they can communicate in French, Portuguese, and English. If the friend also speaks Chinese and Spanish, then with those two languages, the, those two languages won't be used with, the, with that people. So the router says, well, I can support this, for instance, uh, uh, 32 bits or well, so we, they are going to tell each other, well, I'm capable of routing IPv4 traffic in IPv6 only networks. So this is when Piana Iana gave five to this concept that the extended next topping coding. And the BGP session, many of you may know it. Basically, I have two routers. They exchange some parameters. And after the BGP 
update the router. We'll pass all the BGP chart and learns it learns a lot of prefixes and finally it's going to make it go through an algorithm that is what they, it will inject in the routing table for the update BGP some we're going to see something similar in, at the demo we are going to have that when a router announces a prefix the router receiving it will continue to will keep on announcing it to the rest of the peers <coughs> So remember that you can ask questions if you wish before we start the demo. You can ask questions and people online can ask questions too. In Zoom online, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. This is a demo we're going to have today. This cloud we have up here, there are three routers here, routers one, two, and three. They are connected to PCs one and three. And this is totally with IPv6. So what are we going to do? These PCs are IPv4, and we're going to reach from PC1, the other PC, obviously in IPv4, but it will be routed here without any issues. So this is what we're going to do. Now, obviously, we're going to do this using, using the features we have here. So let us do the setup of the first router. It's good that I have a brief script here that does the IP setup. Let's do this very rapidly so we understand what the script does. There are similar things for the other routers. So this is router number one. So let us rapidly locate this. This was the router on the left. We are using FRR for routing purposes. And once again, the number of vendors that are already implementing this mechanism all the major ones and some smaller ones have this capability. So what do we have in this router? You have two interfaces, NP013 and C8. C8 is the one for the PC, which is IPv4. But if you look upwards, the only thing it has is IPv6. This is up here. Oh, 
All right. So having done that, what I will do is to set up the IP of the device and then check FRR. So let us set this up as any router. You already know how FRR works. So let us tell it it's a BGP 65001 and this is a private AS, a private ASN. And in addition to that, it is router number one. In general terms, I personally I personally like to identify the router in a static way, in an explicit way, or whichever way you would like to call it. Because if we don't do it in this way, then if this changes in the future, then you might have some kind of issues with the network. So we're going to tell all the routers, no BGP request policy. This, this is something that I love because it's more and more implemented among the vendors explicitly what occurred in the past to BGP. One would say announce this prefix to this. This was a create the BGP session and this was done automatically. But today for security reasons and also in order to avoid inconveniences with the announcements, the devices mandatorily required you to do a roadmap or filter list. So you have to announce what you say you're going to announce. Now let's do the magic. Let us define the neighbors. Normally, we create the neighbors with the, creating the IP address. Let us also recall that in the IGP world, in the OSPF and others, the protocols or self-discovered the neighbors. BGP does not do this. It has to do unicast. If I'm on one side, I'm going to announce the neighbor on the other side. So this is done manually. But in this case, we're not going to do it in that way. It's going to self-discover the neighbors that are in the next phase. Now the traffic will continue to be in unicast. And this is not a BGP limitation, it is a TCP issue. And sending it to multicast, well, is something you cannot do. So, we're going to tell the that the neighbor is the ENP 0S interface. So basically, what would we do with this last command? What we're telling it, it's the same way as we did this traditionally. Traditionally, you had a global setup where you indicated the interface, or the neighbors rather, you wish it to talk with, and then the address family and the neighbor for the address family. We're going to do exactly the same thing here with a slight change in the commands. What did we do here? In this NP0S3 interface, we're going to get neighbors located in external autonomous systems. We're going to speak eBGP. And now the other command that is important to define here is the capability it will use. The capability which is called extended next hop. So basically, let's check here. Let's do it here. So basically, this corresponds to RFC 579. Five, five. And once we defined the neighbors, we're going to enter the address family, 
the IPv4 address family, although the neighbor, well, the neighbor isn't even speaking with IPv4 and IPv6, but we're interested in picking up the interface in the IPv4 address family. I'm going to put an additional command, which is redistribute connected. Why? Now, let us remember that in this interface over here, you have IPv4. So this is a way of telling the neighbors the, you're going to talk eBGP that will be self-discovered. You will be distribute the connected in the IPv4 world. Now, what is happening behind this? This router here at this moment is awaiting the RS from this device over here. Now, here, this router number one is waiting RES from the devices that are connected, which is this guy over here. And here, we're going to tell this one over here the capacity of extending next hop through the interface. And what will happen then, once they receive an RA, it will know, well, here you have an RA, I'm going to automatically add it, as if you would do so manually, but this is done automatically as a neighbor, and we'll try to talk with the neighbor right away. Now the routing, which is important, will be done entirely in link local. Now why is this possible? Let me stop here with the commands. So when you do routing, and so if I have, let's imagine an IP4, I'm going to do the routing to the end with the physical address of the devices, with the MAC address. So if I'm a router and I get a packet and I know where do I have to send it, how do I send it to the next hop? This is done through the MAC address. So in the IPv6 world, the same happens exactly in the same way. I'm going to have the link local address of the other extreme, of the other end, but when I receive it in my routing table, I will know that the IPv4 destination will be sent to a given link local that has a given MAC address. So this works like a charm. And what about the rest? This will be done a bit more rapidly, so we have time for everything. Can you hear me? All right. In router number two, basically, I have the same. This device here is number three. I have IPv4 here. Uh, let me check where I have IPv6 is ENP0S8. So I'm in number three, and here we put the router ID. Let's remember that the router ID is a field called ID within the open message of the BGP. And we're going to say not to ask, for, it doesn't require policies, and the neighbor was NP008. ENP 0S8 and EBGP. And we're also going to state that this interface will have the capacity of extending next hop. So let's go to the IPv4 address family. We enable the neighbor. This part is identical as the way you are used to doing this. And we're also going to state K 
Kubelet extended, redistribute connected. And this is the way in which I know what I will be redistributing. And here we have it. It's going to redistribute what is with a C. So let's go to the router in the middle. We did this quite rapidly, right? Now, the one we have just set up, which was done very rapidly, is this device over here, the one on the right. We said redistribute the connected networks, and you're going to do this through this interface. So that's all. And in R2, which is a device that has only IPv6, it will have the capacity of routing everything in a very good way. And what I like about these mechanisms is that we are already speaking about saving IPs. Let us recall that in a dual stack network, this works perfectly well. You will know your own needs. But in a dual stack network, traditionally, I have to do the maintenance of two TCP IP stacks. I have to do maintenance of IPv4 to IPv6. And at the same time, behind this, there is a lot of work that has to be done because I have to man manipulate access list security, the services I'm listening to. So I have to do maintenance for each of the services. It works very well, that's quite true. But depending on the network, you maybe have very large networks, this might imply a lot of work. So if I manage to take the routing core to IPv6, I only have to take care of one stack which is the one of the IPv6 stack. So with this device here, this is router number two, the one in the middle. This one has only IPv6. And let us do the setup. For the BGP. So basically, it's more of the same. Ultimately, these are the same commands. And the difference is that in router number two, I have nothing to distribute. I'm not going to redistribute IPv4. It has no IPv4 address. So let us wait a couple of seconds. And I log into these other machines as well. So let's go to router number one very briefly. Um, I would like you to see this. And this is the beauty of the extended next hop encoding. I'm in router number one. And I put show IP route. This is a routing table. Without doubt, we have the C for connected, which is 1011. This is router number one. This IP has been set up for one of the interfaces. Now, the beauty of this is that through BGP, we're learning 10330 slash 24 with eBGP, which is 20, that's the distance, through a link local. We don't have time 
But if I go to router 2 and I check the link local and the interface it will receive, we will see that it corresponds to this. And a tip. And you have the MAC address of the devices in number two. I can see that this is the one here, the interface, and when it was turned on, 2.44 minutes ago. Now, what is the beauty of all this? Well, to finish, we're going to ping from one PC to another. So I am in PC2. Let me see whether I can reach PC2. This routing is taking place within in this uh, IPv6 only cloud, 10, 15, 20 routers. We don't have to uh, install IPv4 in uh, the machines. It's uh, it's uh, native without any overhead, any overload of the packets. You don't have to put a 40 uh, 40 byte uh, tunnel. It's it's absolutely native. So now let's see PC2 TCP dump and P0S3. Here I have a web zero. We won't have the time to do all this. Anyway, it's not necessary. Let me repeat the pin. Okay, and here we see that the packet is reaching there uneventfully. There's no native. It's not uh, that we see, oh, look, uh, the IP of IPC1 is 10, uh, 1, 1, 2. It's not that I need uh, some other IP. I wanted, so here we're going to finish this part of uh, the course. Now we're going to switch gears to another topic, but I really want you to take this home. I hope this will be productive. Uh, no, be aware that this exists. If, if Please check that these features exist in your networks. And there's even there are even uh, very large vendors that have been supporting it for a couple of years. And uh, this will make it easier that with a single stack, uh, well, some people say, well, with IPv4, IPv6, I have two memory, two cache. Um, uh, but uh, the most you can save, the better, because that may make a difference and uh, you receive uh, fewer complaints. So any questions about this? Good morning, Ali. Ariel Wheeler. Um, do you think that this might replace the need, for instance, that an, at an IXP they may have to use IPv4 via Atlantic peering? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Do you think that this feature could be used, for instance, at an IXP? To, uh, so you won't have to use public IPv4 in a land appearing. What a question. That's a very good question. I've read many 
papers about that, but nothing about uh, IXPs at present. But if you think of it, because ultimately, if everything, if they all support the feature, they could use Link Local, and that would be it. I can't think of any reasons why that would not be possible. I can't uh, say no. I think it's absolutely valid, and I can imagine that it can be used in IXP. However, I'm not aware of anybody who does it. Of course, in data centers, in networks, but at an IXP specifically, I'm not aware. It could be a good alternative to uh, to save uh, addresses. I, I love that question. I knew that Ariel was going to come with something new. Thank you. So now let's uh, change the subject. Okay, ahora sí vamos a conversar de NAT. So now we're going to talk about NAT64, DNS64. This, I, I want you to really pay attention here. Because much of what uh, we're going to see in the, in the future will, you'll, you'll need to understand these concepts very clearly. Basically, let me start by explaining NAT64 and DNS64. NAT64 is a transition mechanism specifically designed for IPv6 clients. So, please, there's an IPv6-only network. So it, it solves uh, the problem when uh, the IPv6-only clients wish to establish uh, outbound connections with TCP, UDP, or ICMP. So I uh, do, do what I before. So I have an IPv6-only uh, network, and I want to reach a destination that is IPv4-only. So in this here, I, I want to, for instance, late, late, later on when Wesley comes uh, to talk, um, you'll need to understand this. And DNS64 is another transition mechanism that traditionally comes with NAT64. Or DNS64 accompanies NAT64, and we're going to see why. So re let's recap. DNS 64. It's a DNS translation uh, at the level of DNS that works as a complement to, to enable uh, IPv6 only clients to always obtain a response of IPv6. So, in the DNS, how, how can I manage this? Well, that is done through DNS 64 because I, if I run into an IPv6 only network, I don't want. Uh, 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 it is there that uh, DNS uh, 64 does its magic. We're going to see it in detail. So, the motivation, the rational is the imminent depletion of the IPv4 space. There are few, very few IPv4 addresses to use in your ISP. So, I'm saving some IPv4 addresses. The growth uh, of uh, some uh, growth of clients and platforms of IPv6 and IPv6 only, and some apps and borders in the internet still don't work uh, with IPv6, but they support IPv4. So, what happens with the issue of translation? In general terms, we know that an IPv4 device cannot speak to an IPv6 uh, device if they are IPv6 and IPv4 only respectively their language they don't share a language so what will we do with this mechanism we need to translate the this at a, a, la a layer 3 
I need to translate this IPv4 packet into this IPv6 uh, packet and the other way around. An IPv6 packet needs to be translatable to IPv4 and that is what NAT64 does. Here you have a brief example. To the left, I have IPv4, to the right, IPv6, and you see that at uh, layer two, the MAC address is uh, well preserved. In layer three, there is a translation and port and data. I don't touch them. I'm only worried about this layer three little piece. Important things, NAT64 only translate unicast. The users at the end can share public IPv4 addresses. I have a network that is IPv6 uh, only, and then they have to navigate uh, to the outside world, and they may use a published IPv4. I may have static uh, translations. I may have an IPv6 translation that is mapped uh, to a static uh, IPv4 and the other way around. I'm, I'm interested in uh, discussing this. Usually, I'm going to use this slash 96 network prefix because basically an IPv4 has 32 bits. 96 plus 32, 128. That's the length of an IPv6 address. the part of DNS 64, the IPv6 nodes must believe that some IPv4 destination may be reached through an IPv6 address. If I have an IPv6 only and I am translated in the middle, I there's no need for me to be aware of it. And if the destination is IPv4, I don't need to know that it's IPv4. I just need magic in the way, showing the device, the remote device, as if it were IPv6, like myself. So let's see what happens here. I have an IPv6 network to left. Uh, you have uh, the animation here. I'm going to open example.com. I go to DNS 64. DNS 64 uh, is recursive and it looks for the authoritative DNS, for example.com, and it brings an IP4 address. So, of course, here we have the problem. This, how am I going to give this IPv4 address to an IPv6 only host? No way, I need to do something. And that is why then the DNS64 will come and we see it there. And it's going to synthesize it. He'll pick the response of example.com and is going to synthesize it into an IPv6 address. And this is the response that the host will get later on. When the IPv6 only host wants to reach uh, this, they, he'll believe that he'll be reaching this IPv6 destination and everything will be fine. Now what happens here? Here, it is very important for NAT64 and DNS64 to be configured in a complementary manner. There needs to be a lot of information between the two, and this is important because I have, may have a box of uh, DNS64 and NAT64. I need NAT64 to do the following. When the destination, in this case 64FF9, when the packet is about to leave, it will know that when it's this destination, I need to remove the first 96 bits of uh, the address. And these last uh, 32 corresponds to an IPv4 address and correct it uh, correctly to go out to the IPv4 world. So that when I say that they need to be complementary, it is the response of DNS64 needs to match the traffic that will go through this router. This is just a regular uh, 
um, router that can do NAT64. Now, if there's a destination that does not correspond, the destination does not correspond to uh, this, it 64 uh, uh, ever 96 it say no this you don't have to remove the first uh, um, uh, you ha don't have to go through all the process but basically it will be able to reach here the example is a TCP connection a TCP sync uh, is sent and a TCP act is uh, uh, received. Here I have a small demo of this. Any questions? Please let me know if you have any questions about all this. So while so we're going to work on the next lab. Any questions, Mr. Villegas said regarding the first part of the presentation and routing. For this case, it is not necessary to have the MPLS backbone. So this is what I want to show you. So the interface is are not there, they are not MPLS, so there's no kind of MPLS set up in the devices. And he has asked if this can use TCP or yes, so you cannot use TCP. You can use this without any issues for the purpose of translation. Now, if our backbone is would be MPLS, you could do it in that way. So, a question, Elias. What is the most recommended method if the NAT destroys one packet to produce another? Well, it's 464X LAT. 464X LAT is a mechanism that we like quite a lot. We have seen it operating quite a lot, and it has been deployed extensively throughout the world. Now, personally, I love it. But I don't like to give a clear-cut response because each network is different. You know your own networks, the good, the bad, the positive things. So without doubt, if it's for XLAT is a mechanism that is wonderful, it's perfect, and we can recommend that perfectly well. Mm. 
So these are questions we get through the Zoom. Manuel Teixeira asks a question that I think is great. Can you use Yul as a translation right IP4 and IP6? Yes, perfectly well. At LACNIC, right from the beginning of Joule, we love how Joule works. We have organized courses, we have organized webinars on how to use Joule for translating from IP4 to IP6 always. So we really recommend that. And it's good that you asked the question because I'm going to do the demo in something that is not Joule. And if you were to ask me, I would recommend it doing it in Joule. So let's explain this very briefly. This is a very simple network, but it's perfect for this example. On the left, we have a PC in an IPv6 only network. On the right, we have an IPv4 device. And we have the translator on this side. We use Tiger on this side. Now, Jewel, you can do this blindfolded. It would work perfectly well. And in addition, whatever the software you use, I'm interested in you paying attention to the concept. So this guy over here has DNS 6.4 and NAT 6.4. And we're going to reach this IPv6 only network and the web server. So this has an interface that does the, has the internet. It has this leg to the internet so that DNS 6.4 can go out to the internet and have a recursiveness and see that is something that really works. It's not just a lab that was set up for this purpose. So let's start with the part on the left. This is a PC. There's not much more to explain, but let us explain. Let us describe it. So there's a part that I would like to explain in detail. This is a script that I will execute, and it has an interface that is the one we're going to pick up. We include an IPv6 address, uh, IPv6 only. We're going to add a static route, a default route, and this is where I would like to stop and explain. We're going to say that this is a DNS server of the device. So in this case, as you do in the Linux world, there is a text file where you can set the DNS servers that the device is going to use. So we're going to tell it that it's going to use as the DNS servers, 2001 DB8 colon 12 colon colon 1. And why do we do this? Because I want to have a server that does not 64. That's the important part. So let's execute this. So this was set up. If we check the file, slash edc slash resolve.conf, and this is the name server and the root. Let's go back to the diagram with the router in the middle. Now let us set up the router in the middle.
this has two interfaces, one with IPv4 and one with IPv6, and that there is one that it receives as a client to have connectivity. As a client of the virtual box in order to have connectivity to the internet. So we're going to put MASH Let's see if I have connectivity to the internet. All right, perfect. Okay, here we have a whole set of things. I'm going to explain these as much as possible. We only have five minutes to go before lunch, but we do have enough time. So what are we going to do here? At IP level, we already explained the connectivity of the device. We also have scripts. That do the following. So this is what this program does. And I won't dwell too much on this because what I would like to convey is the concept. So what are we doing here with Taiga? It's going to create an interface, Tune, which is a logic interface in the Linux world. It's like a loopback interface. And we are setting an interface that is NAT64 with IPv4 addressing. And if you don't have the Taiga, included, it's going to require this. So here we have the NAT64 interface and a couple of routes to the interfaces. And these are the ones that have to coincide with the responses of the DNS64, because I'm interested in applying the algorithm and the remove the first 96 bits Based on what? Based on the DNS64 gives me, which has to match with what I'm going to do in the NAT64. So let's execute this. And the last line basically restarts the bind service because bind has internal functions that are capable of recognizing some of the new interfaces and modifications to the IP of the interfaces. But because I'm adding new interfaces and changing the IP addressing, I always recommend restarting. And in the PC, in the web server, he corrects himself. The web server is IPv4 only, and we assign an IP address and a static route. So let's check whether this works. So let's take a look at a couple of things. If I now try to reach, well, this is a service that I have in my domain, acostasite.com, which is called IPv4. So I'm not reaching it. And this is what I want to show you. So what is happening here very rapidly? If you check this out in your PCs, and I won't do this for time reasons, we realize that if you check this, ip4.acostasite.com has no assigned IPv6 address. So that is where DNS64 does its magic. So then the DNS64 had to synthesize the response and created the response you have here, 2001 DB8 colon 1 colon FF FF colon colon C088 colon 102. If I take this C0, 
which is in hexadecimal. In decimal, it's 192, and A8 is 108. One is two. So that's the IP address that the web server has at this moment. Now, let us rapidly look at the bind. In fact, Jordi, I paid attention to you. This is the access list in the bind, as should be the case. So what is the bind doing right now? The bind, we all know, is a DNS server. It's telling it that when you get devices from this IP, any device of uh, 201 colon db8 colon colon slash 32, it's going to be synthesized with this slash 96 that you have over here. And if we look at this, it's going to match with the configuration we did in Tiger. But the concept is what I'm interested in. So everything that happens in the IPv4 world only, it's going to be answered in this way and adding the 32 bits of the IP4 address. Now, having said this, let's double check. I pick up the tiger, and it even picked up an IP to which it gave this 192.168.255.250, and I repeat this here ping ip4.acostasite.com. And it's responding perfectly well. So let's do this with the web server once and for all, because we're running out of time. Let's see whether this works. Usually I test this at the lab, but I didn't test this. So I was going to put here IPv4 dot cost dot ipv6 dot com it says hello and laknik 39 i'm a sad web server because i i am ipv4 only very bad and i see in the apache log apache log it tells me that a machine came from ipv from ip192.168.255.250 uh, and we look at the tiger mapping uh, 255, 250. Remember, this corresponds. More log tiger dynamic map. So, bingo. Here we see the mappings that Taiga has done so far. It's telling me that the machine with IPv6 uh, uh, gave this IPv4 address. That's what we see in the web server. And here, this is the timestamp to tell you what time the mapping was uh, done. Any questions, any doubts about any of the two parts of the presentation? There, could you go to the mic and introduce yourself, please? Alejandro, you showed the config of the router when it does NAT64, when it removes the IPv6 part and turns it into IPv4. You, did you just show that in the configuration? I didn't see that when you configured the router because we saw it with the DNS, but not, uh, yes. That is exactly here in this last part. What's happening in that line that you see there? It's telling you that when the destination 
the slash 96 that is the same slash 96 that the DNS will give you back will send it through the interface NAT64. Tiger knows that what enters that interface remove uh, the uh, to to remove one part and keep the other and to make it go through the outbound uh, interface. So well, thank you for the question. Later on, NAT64 is a mechanism that's very good, but I really care about the concepts because what we see this afternoon has a lot to do with this. So I want you, I want to just settle this and, well, any other questions? There's somebody asking, is there a private IPv4 range? Uh, IPv6 range is uh, just the same as IPv4. Well, this doesn't have to do with this uh, tutorial, but they don't just exist as such. The most similar thing to an IPv4, a private IPv4 address that exists in IPv6 are the ULA addresses, unique local address. Yes. Yes, you can work a lot with, yes, you can work with that perfectly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's go for lunch. Please come back at 2. Lunch time is from 1 to 2 in rooms 5 and 6. I understand that it is to our right, to your right, rooms 5 and 6, and lunch is served until 2. Goodbye.